Good evening. It's, I appreciate your pastor allowing us to come, and I sure appreciate Greg Bowers. He's been my friend. I've known him since 1992. We met him at another church, and we hadn't been in touch with each other for a while, and I'm sure glad to see he's still faithful serving the Lord all these years. That's a blessing to me. My name is John Olson, and I am deaf. I was born deaf. I have a sister two years older than me, also deaf. We don't have any other family members who are deaf. We just believe that God made us deaf so that we can reach other deaf people with the gospel. My wife is here interpreting for me. This is Trisha. We, this December, we will have been married 29 years. She's from, I'm from Florida. She's from Washington. We met in Bible College in Florida, and we got married. And we have four children. Our oldest is Deborah. She's 26. Eric is 23. They're our natural children. They're grown and on their own. And then we have two deaf children that we adopted. This right here is Amanda. She's 14, and Amanda's from Peru. And then this is David. He's 10, and he's from China. And we're so glad to have them with us as we travel. I'm so thankful to get to come tonight. I'd like to tell you what we're going to do. We are Go Deaf Missions, and we are not going to just one country. We've been in Peru several times. We adopted Amanda from Peru. But our focus is on missions worldwide with the deaf. My wife and I started out as missionaries to Germany years ago. We were in Germany for six years. It was wonderful. We loved it. And then we came back to America, and I pastored for 17 years. And while I pastored those years, multiple missionaries contacted me about coming and working with them from different countries. And we've had the opportunity to go to Australia. There we helped Robert, Lisa, Gunter with their work. They asked us if we needed any help. And so we took a team and we went down to Australia in 2005. And it was a wonderful opportunity. Robert and Lisa are in Melbourne and we helped them launch a new work for the deaf there. We were so excited and God blessed it. It was just a good time. We visited schools and nursing homes, and we spent a lot of time with Robert. We encouraged him. And then we came back home, and it was really a blessing to get to go. I also knew a missionary that I from our college. His name is Danny, and he's from Panama. His wife, Heather, is a sign language interpreter. And so they went back to Panama, and they're focus is on ministry to the indigenous people, the Indian people, and they live on reservations, the Gobi tribe. And there are 13 churches there that they help in. And after a while, Heather contacted me and said, we found a little deaf boy named Moises. And he's four years old. But in Panama, the, the Hispanic people go to schools for the deaf, they have schools for the deaf, but among the Indian people that live on the reservation, the tribal peoples, they are not included in those schools. And so this four-year-old little deaf boy can't go to school there. And Heather contacted me and said, what, what can I do? And I said, you need to teach him sign language, you need to get him language. So she started teaching me, teaching him. She contacted me again later and said, we need some help. We've got 13 churches and we've been trying to get them to accept the stuff little boy and they don't want him in church. They think maybe he's demon possessed or God has punished their parents somehow. And we're, been, we're trying to explain that it's okay that he's deaf. And so we went down there, we took a team. And we went down and we wanted to show them that deaf people are normal people just like everybody else. We went to seven of those 13 churches. I preached in those, we did a dramatic performance and we did special music. These are churches with no electricity, no running water. We went over hills and down paths across streams and tiptoed over rocks to get to church. And church was a pole barn and a clearing with a thatched roof on it. And people, everybody came to church, including the dogs and the chickens that they ran around during the service. It was quite unusual. And I preached down there. And the people were just fascinated. 
They didn't know that deaf people could do these kinds of things like other people can. While I was there, I talked to Heather and I said, there must be other deaf more than this one little boy. There's a lot of Indian people here on the reservation. She said, oh, I've been looking. I can't find any other deaf people. I said, well, let me try and help you. So we left our team behind and Danny and Heather and I went looking in the villages and I would go in and say, I can't hear and I'm looking for other people and somebody would lead us down a path and we'd go into a hut and I'd tell them I couldn't hear and, and we found a deaf woman after a while named Anna, 40 years old with no language. She was really nervous about meeting us and I told her I couldn't hear and I started pantomiming with her and trying to communicate with her and then I asked her for other deaf people and in one afternoon we found six deaf. Six, and I told Heather, That's, there's more. You just don't know where to find them. You don't know where they are. They don't have any language. I said, the first thing you're gonna have to do is teach them language so you can teach them anything else. One of those deaf ladies that we found was a cousin of one of the pastor's wives of those 13 churches. And Heather said, I have asked her and asked her about deaf people, and she's always said she doesn't know where there's any deaf. And we found out that her cousin was deaf. So we went back into her village, and we found her. And Heather said to the pastor's wife, today we met your cousin who is deaf. And I asked you before, and you told me you didn't know any deaf. And she said, I was ashamed. But now I realize that seeing this team come and, and all that they've done, that God loves deaf people just like hearing people. And I realize we need to do something, and I'm sorry. Yeah. And so we wanted to encourage the people there that it was their responsibility to reach the deaf in their area. We only could stay for nine days. We did all the encouragement we could, and we had to leave, and they said, can you help us more? Can you come back? But I couldn't stay longer because I had to go back and pastor my ministry, and over time, in 2007, a missionary was coming to our church in Florida. His name was Bobby, is Bobby Bonner, and when I saw him on the venue, I knew that name, Bobby Bonner. I used to live in Rochester, New York. I went to National Technical Institute for the Deaf there, and I also went to North Star Bible Institute. Bobby Bonner was a baseball player for the Baltimore Orioles, and they won the World Series in 1993. He was a World Series champion, but he left baseball to do missions work. He was saved, and he came to Rochester to come to our Bible Institute. And so I was in school when he was, and boy, when he came in, I was really excited about that. This was a World Series champion, and he'd give it up baseball to do missions. He was probably 21 or 22. I was 18, and I went up and told him I came here. He shook my hand, and he took off. He was afraid to talk to me. So in 2007, he was coming to our church to speak about missions. And I thought, well, he probably doesn't know who I am, but after church I went up to him and I started to talk to him. And I said, I can't hear. And he said, oh, hi, I'm happy to see you in sign language. You're John Olson, aren't you? And I said, you can sign? And he said, I have to. And when I went to Zambia, there were so many deaf that we had to learn sign language. I don't sign very well, but my wife and my daughter are better than I am. And I thought he was doing pretty good. And I said, I remember back in 1984 when I saw you in Rochester, I tried to talk to you then, and you were scared. You took off. He said, I know. I remember that. I'm really sorry. I, I didn't know what to do. So we talked every night of that conference. He kept coming and talking to me, and he said, John, I need your help. I need you to come to Zambia. And I said, why? What do you, want, what do you need there? And he said, well, we've started 16 deaf ministries over there. He said, but I just know so little sign language, and I'm not able to teach the deaf very much Bible because I don't know enough sign language. I want you to come and teach our deaf. Come and stay a whole summer. Teach for three months. And, and teach our people how to sign better, too. I, Whoa, I'd love to do that. So I went to our senior pastor, and he said, no, you, you've got to be here in Florida. You can't, you can't be gone for three months. I wasn't able to go. 
Not too long after that, Bobby Bonner got dengue fever and he had to go back to the United States. So it didn't work out and we started praying for him, but I really wanted to do something for those deaf people in Zambia. In 2015, I met Robert and Lisa Gunter again in Ringgold, Georgia. I thought they were supposed to be in Australia, but they were in Ringgold. And I said, what are you guys doing here? And he said, what are you doing here? I thought you were in Florida. I said, well, I'm preaching a Bible conference this week for the deaf. And he said, he said, well, I'm on a furlough for a year, and I'm traveling, visiting churches. So we started walking and talking. And Robert started saying, oh, you don't know. You don't know. Robert started to cry, and he said, you don't know. And I said, I don't know what, Robert. And he said, in 2005, when you brought your team, my wife and I were so discouraged, we were so frustrated, we were ready to quit our missions work and just go back to America. But then you came and you brought your team and you encouraged us and we decided to stay and we've been serving the Lord there and we're still there. Well, that was exciting. What a blessing. I was so glad we went. We didn't know that. Robert said, listen, I, I got to tell you about something. He said, I've been going over to the Solomon Islands, and these are islands just off the coast of Australia, and he's been passing out Bibles over there. They've passed out over 50,000 Bibles. He said, but while I was there, I started finding out about the deaf. We think there's about 3,000 deaf there between Waddle Canal and Malaya, and I, I want you to help us. Can you help us? The deaf need the gospel there. There's no way to preach them. And I said, well, Robert, I love nothing more, but I, I, I'm a pastor in Florida. I don't know, but I'm glad you're going. But I really wanted to help him. In 2017, we had more and more missionaries contacting us, more and more opportunities coming up, and I talked to the Lord about it, and I went to my wife and I said, I think soon the Lord is going to have us resign, and we're going to go back into missions, and go to some of these countries and see if we can do something. One Sunday morning, my wife was teaching Sunday school. She taught the deaf ladies class, and a man came around and found her. His name is Ben Walker, and he asked, he said, Trisha, Dr. Dewey Painter is looking for your husband. He wants him to take a team to go to Liberia. And Trisha said, well, I'll tell him. So she went and found me and told me they wanted to know. Now, honestly, I didn't even really know where Liberia was. I didn't know. So after church, when I got home, I Googled it. And I found it was a country in Africa. So I said, why, what, why is he asking me? Well, there, he has a missionary friend named Hal Nichols. Hal's got a church. It's for hearing people. And he's got a children's home. And he's got several areas of ministry that he's doing. And one Sunday morning, he got up to preach, and 35 deaf walked into his service. He didn't know what to do. Nobody there knew any sign language. So that he started looking for help. 35 deaf just walked into his service. So what he was able to find out is the government is bankrupt over there, and they closed all the school for the schools for the deaf. The deaf didn't know where to go. There was one deaf guy that had met Hal Nichols, and he said, I know a guy that might be able to help us, and he brought all the deaf to church. And the missionary called him and said, please come and help us. 35 deaf. Can you imagine if 35 deaf just showed up and nobody knew sign language? And so they contacted us, and, I, and my wife and I decided it's just time to surrender. So we surrendered to go back into missions. Two weeks later, another missionary, Alberto Gomez, came to see me. He's a missionary to Colombia, mm -hmm. South America. And he came and he said, John, now I've known him. We graduated Bible college together in 1990 in Florida. And he came and said, John, I've been a missionary in Colombia for 30 years. And I've started over 25 churches for the Colombian people. But none of those churches have any ever reached the deaf. Could you come and help us?
Can you teach us some sign language so we can learn how to give the deaf the gospel of Jesus Christ? I said, oh, I'd be so happy to do that. Right now I have a list of 18 countries where missionaries have contacted us and asked us to come and help them start a work to the deaf. Some already have a work, like Zambia that I mentioned, and they need some help, and they need some teaching, and they need to improve in their sign language. They need, need deeper Bible teaching and more doctrine so that they can do a better job spreading the gospel and the word of God. But we have 18 countries that have asked us to come. After Robert heard that I resigned the pastorate to become a missionary, he called me and said, John, I want you to come over to the Solomon Islands with me. I said, Robert, not right now. I, our family's got to raise some support. We've got to get our support. We've got to do deputation, and then I can come and help you. He said, no, I want you to come now. Just make a short trip. Just We need to go now. And I said, Robert, why? You're already going over there. You don't need me. And he said, no, listen. He said, you're deaf, and I'm hearing. And I said, so, what's the point? That doesn't matter. And Robert said, because I've been going over there and I'm working with tribal chiefs and I'm trying to explain to the people that we want to start something for the deaf there, and they don't think the deaf can do anything. And so Robert's been trying to get them to understand that it's worth educating the deaf, and he said, I need you to come over there and just show them that you have a normal life like they do, that you can drive, that you have a family, that you can you can communicate, and I said, okay, I'll pray about it. So we started praying, and God started providing the money, and we raised the money to go. So last June, we flew to Australia on June 21st. We met with Robert and his wife, and Robert and two other Australians joined us, and we made a team to go to the Solomon Islands. We stayed for three weeks, and it was very different. We went to two islands. First we went to Guadalcanal, and then we went over to Malaita. On Guadalcanal, you have the capital, Haniara. That's the main city there. And we went to Haniara and started visiting the, and telling people that we were going to have a service for the deaf in two weeks. And we started passing out tracts, and we, had, uh, we got invited over to the Red Cross, who has an elementary school for the deaf, and I got to present <coughs> Uh, my testimony and tell them the gospel of Jesus Christ while I was there and they listened and had a lot of questions. Now it's all volunteers at the Red Cross. There's no certified teachers there, no qualified teachers, nobody with a degree. They're all volunteers helping the deaf, about 30 students. and So we were trying to give them some things that they could do. And then we went over to a Catholic training center for the deaf. They have students from 13 to any age. I met one deaf man who is 62 years old. He came from another island over to, to Guadalcanal so he could learn sign language so he can get a job. At 62 years old, he's learning sign language for the first time. And he came and talked to me, and he asked me if I could help get a job. And I said, no, the sitter can help you, but he wants to get a job. They allowed me to present the gospel at the Catholic school, and so I did. And everybody was very attentive, and they listened, and we, they use Australian Sign Language there, not American Sign Language. If you think the sign language is universal, it's not at all. In Australia, they use a two-handed alphabet, A, B, C, D. They use two hands to make their alphabet. And so after we were on Guadalcanal, we went over we took a ferry over to Malaita. Now that was not a ferry like you have over here. I rode a ferry yesterday from Bremerton over to Seattle. What a nice ride. And we got on and it was so pleasant and there's a cafeteria and it was just a very nice ride across the water and smooth. That was not this ferry. This thing was packed, mom, People carried on all kinds of stuff. People were laid on the floor. There were chicken cages and big bundles, and it was just mom. And not at all like here. It was an old, old ship that China had given them because uh, there were Chinese placards everywhere. And uh, we left an hour late, about 6.50, and 
I was tired, I fell asleep on the boat, and my interpreter friend woke me up and said, look up at the front. My two kids, Amanda and David, were up there at the front, and Amanda was drawing pictures, and there was a woman and a man and their little boy, and she was drawing pictures and giving them to them, and I walked up there. David was writing something, too. He had a piece of paper, and he was writing, are you saved? Is your heart clean? And he drew a white heart. Or is your heart dirty? He drew a black heart and he handed it to the people. And they were looking at that and I thought, I think I'll leave this alone. And I went and sat back down to see what was going to happen. Amanda went and got a lady from our team, Anna, to interpret for them. So Anna went up to the front and I just kind of watched the whole thing unfold. So the man took the paper that David gave him and said, I'm saved and my wife is saved, but our son is only three. He's not saved yet. And David said, well, you need to teach him the Bible. When he grows up, he needs to be saved. And the dad said, okay, I will. And they started talking and the man said to David, how old are you? And David said he was 10 and he was deaf. He said, where are you from? And he explained how he was adopted from China. And Amanda said how she came from Peru. And the guy said, I have never seen anything like this in my whole life. I've never seen somebody deaf communicate like that before. I didn't know that you could understand a conversation with an interpreter. I thought, boy, God's using our kids better than he's using us. It was exciting. It was a blessing. And my kids were showing that deaf people can do something. So we went over... We got over to Malaita, and they have nothing for the deaf there. I mean nothing. We went out visiting, and we promoted a special service we were going to have on Sunday, and we were praying and inviting people to come. We talked to people at several different tribes, and Sunday morning, it just poured. It poured, and we were praying, Lord, I hope somebody will come. Well, a few tribal people came, and a few families came with four deaf children. There was a little girl that was seven, a little boy that was nine, a boy that was 11, and a boy that was 13, and these were all deaf. The little girl knew some sign language because somebody had come over from the main island, from Waddle Canal, and taught a little bit of sign language. It was a Jehovah's Witness lady, but she had left. The other three boys did not know anything. They did not know their own names. We tried to communicate with them. They couldn't communicate. We asked the parents, and what are their names? So I wrote my name on a piece of paper. I spelled out J-O-H-N and stuck that up, pinned that to my chest, and then I showed them how to spell it in Australian Sign Language, and then I started teaching them their names. We wrote their name on a paper, and then I started teaching them how to make the letters that form their names. Your name is Emmanuel, and I, I started teaching them. And boy, they were into that. They were so excited about it. And then our team sang some music, and we did a Bible story, and then I preached a message. It was so exciting. After the service, I knew those kids didn't understand, but they were glued to all that we were doing the whole time. After the service, my wife went and sat down with DK, one of the chiefs, He's a Christian. He's a chief of one of the tribes there. And she sat down with the men and said, what did you think of this today? And DK said, these deaf children don't know it, but today was the first time that deaf people heard the gospel on this island. And we need this here. It was exciting. What a blessing. Pray for them. They now need to take on the responsibility of teaching their deaf the gospel. We went back over to Guadalcanal, and we had a special service on Sunday, and the Catholics got all excited about it. They used their truck to pick up the deaf and bring them. So they brought a truckload of deaf. About 30 deaf people came. They dropped them off from a flatbed truck, and then they went to the other end of the island. They got more deaf people, and the deaf association contacted people for us, and they went out and took taxis and walked, went all over the island trying to find deaf people, and we had 81 deaf come to our service on Sunday morning, not including my family or our team members or any, and not including some of the teachers and the staff, but 81 deaf came to the service, 
and we did music, and we did it all in Australian Sign Language. I'd been there three weeks, and I was just learning all the sign language I could while I was there. Now, I know German Sign Language because we lived in Germany for six years, and sometimes a German word would slip in there, and sometimes a Peruvian sign would slip in there, and it was a little bit, a little bit hard, but, but we made it work, and the people helped me, and I preached in Australian Sign Language, and, uh, and that's what they are using in the Solomon Islands, and 35 deaf accepted Christ as their Savior. And it was a blessing. It was a blessing. After church, or, or on the island, there are two churches, um, two independent Baptist churches, and we told them about the services that we had and all that had happened. There's a guy in one of those churches that works as a taxi driver with a lot of help to us while we were there. Joseph said, you know, missionaries brought the gospel to our island 100 years ago, but we've never tried to reach the deaf. This is the first time we've realized that deaf people could understand the gospel. So I thank the Lord that he allowed us to go to the Solomon Islands. I've only shared with you a couple of stories. I could tell you stories about 18 countries, but I'm asking you to pray for our family, pray we can raise our support. What we want to do is go to a country and stay about three months, teach the people in the church sign language, find deaf people and put it together, teach them the people deaf culture and reach some of the deaf and then put them together and get ministry started and then we'll go to another country and do it again in another country. We have, I mentioned Colombia, Peru, Panama, but there's Nepal, there's Mongolia, there's Zambia, there's Australia, there's Germany, there's Austria, there's Romania, and there, there's quite a list where countries have already told us that they have a need. The World Health Organization says that there are about 360 million deaf in the world. And Christian organizations that have done some research believe that only 2% have ever heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. What about the rest? So pray for our family. We're willing to go and just pray. Get our prayer card. Pray for our family that will raise our support, that we'll be able to go and that we'll be able to reach deaf with the gospel of Jesus Christ and that deaf people around the world will have the opportunity to be saved. Let's go to our Bibles tonight since the Lord called me to be a missionary. I started thinking about what does it mean to be a missionary? And so I read about some famous missionaries in the past, and one of the ones I read about was Hudson Taylor. Yeah. Hudson Taylor lived in the 1850s. He was born to Christian parents, and they dedicated him to the Lord. They said, he is yours. And they had a burden for China, and they dedicated him to China as a little baby. And so when he was 17 years old, Hudson Taylor got saved. His parents told him that they had dedicated him to be a missionary to China, and he was willing to do that. He was married, and he took his family to China. And when he got to China, he started trying to meet people and share the word of God with them. And the Chinese people didn't want anything to do with him. And so he tried to witness to them, and they wouldn't listen to him. They wouldn't have him. And finally somebody said, your hair, it's your hair. Hudson Taylor had red hair, and they had never seen that before in China. So he thought, well, what am I going to do? So he went back home, and he decided that he'd get some black dye and change his hair, and he wouldn't wear British clothes anymore. He'd put on Chinese attire, and he went back to the people, and they looked him over. And he said, he's like us. And they began to listen. And he shared the gospel, and many of the Chinese people began to be saved. He realized there was so much work that he couldn't do the work alone, and he went back to England, and he said, I need help. Come and help me in China. And he challenged over 300 families to pour into the land of China. And through him, many Chinese people were one for the Lord, he began the Chinese, China Inland Mission. They called him the Chinese man with the round eyes. <laughs> I read that story and I thought, what a good missionary. And then I read some more and I found another missionary, a guy named William Carey. 
William Carey was from England as well in the 1790s, and he was a pastor there in England. He was not a well-educated man, but somehow or another he had learned and mastered four languages. He was self-taught, fluent in four languages. Now I thought about that. I lived in Germany and I tried to learn to speak German. Now sign language wasn't too bad, but learning that grammar and that German language, I'm just telling you it was hard, hard, hard. But William Carey knew four languages that he mastered in his own time. He went to a preacher's fellowship one day and he said, I've got a burden for India. They need the gospel over there. And so those pastors came together and agreed to support him and they sent him to India. And so he sailed to India, and when he got there, he looked for the Bible in their language, but he couldn't find it. And so he prayed, Lord, I know these four languages. Help me to translate the Bible into their language. And he began to translate the Bible and give it to the people. And then he found another group of people who spoke a different dialect, and he went back and took the Bible, and he translated it for those people. And then another group, and the Lord used William Carey to make 23 language translations of the Bible for the Indian people. And for over 200 years, those same Bibles are still being used to reach multitudes of people in India. And I thought, what a great missionary. And then I read some more, and I found the best missionary that has ever been in history. Never has there been a better missionary, never will there be a better missionary than this one, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Turn to John chapter 4, verse 4. John chapter 4, and verse 4. And he must needs go through Samaria. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the word of God. For Jesus and his life's example. Lord, I thank you for this church. Lake Valley Baptist Church. Lord, I pray that you'll be with the pastor as he's away and give him safety as he returns. I pray that you'll be with our service tonight. Help my signs to be clear, my wife to voice clearly. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now you might be saying, wait a minute. Lord didn't call me to be a missionary to go to China, like Hudson Taylor, I'm not a missionary. I'm not gonna go to India like William Carey did. I'm gonna be right here in America. I have news for you about the word missionary. I've looked at a lot of different definitions, and this is the one that I like. A missionary is someone who goes with a message to tell. Let me say that again. A missionary is someone who goes with a message to tell. So you and I that are here tonight, if you've been saved, you have a message. I have a message, and the Lord has commanded us to go and tell people this message. Now here in Moses Lake, who's going to tell people about Jesus? Who's going to tell the state of Washington about Jesus Christ? Who's going to tell the Northwest? Who's going to tell the United States? Who's going to get the gospel to the world? Who's going to tell the deaf and who's going to tell the hearing? It needs to be you and I. So let's look at the greatest missionary, Jesus Christ, and see what made him a missionary. It says, and he must needs go through Samaria. Well, why did he need to go to Samaria? It's important. Look at verses 5 through 9. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. 
for his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Here we see the Samaritan woman. Now imagine with me that right here in the middle is Samaria. The people of Samaria, if you read the historical record, after where it came from the, the northern kingdom, Israel was divided, and then Syria came in, Assyria came in and took over the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom of Judah was still there. Jerusalem was the capital in Judah, and uh, Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. When a Jewish person needed to make a trip that would go north of Samaria, when they would come along and get to the borders of Samaria, they didn't like those people. And they would go around. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't see her race. He didn't see her sin. What he saw was a precious lost soul. And he must needs go to see this woman. Now God wants you to go out to the people of Moses Lake. Maybe say, well, I'm so tired. I'm real busy. I, I don't have time. It's too far. We've got a sign out there. It says Lake Valley Baptist Church. If people want to come to church, they'll just drive by and see that sign, and they'll decide that they can come on their own. Our church is in the on the internet, and if people want to come, they'll just see it there. But but I don't have to do anything. That's not what Jesus did. Look with me again at verse six. It says, Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey. It was a long trip for Jesus. He sat down there because he was tired. The way was far. He still went because that woman needed to hear something. He had something to tell her. And so he made the trek to get to where she was. I want to tell you about a friend I knew back in 1979. Her name was Tammy. On um, Sunday morning, I was in church. I was 14 years old. And my teacher, Fred, asked us if anybody knew somebody deaf that lived near us, somebody he could visit and invite to church. So I raised my hand. And I said, I know a little girl named Tammy. She lives near my house. And he said, we'll visit her. And I said, well, she doesn't sign. She's oral. He said, that's okay. We'll visit her. And so after church, he said, we're going to go and visit today, right now. <clears throat> and so I said, okay, we'll go after church. So we got in the van for the deaf. Now, I told you, we lived in Florida. It was April. That van didn't have any air conditioning. We got in and we started driving. It was so hot. We started dropping off deaf people. I was last on the route. We drove and we drove and dropped off people. And I got home. I was the last one home. My shirt was so wet you could wring it out. And so we went looking for Tammy. And we found her and I asked her to come over. And I told her, this is my teacher, Fred. Can I... Can we talk with you? And she said, okay. And she sat down on the grass, and he brought out a picture book, and I held it, and he started sharing verses with her and showing her pictures, and he told her Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And he told Tammy how she was a sinner, and because of sins, you would die, and you couldn't go to heaven, you would go to hell if you had your sins. And then... He turned the page and he told her Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, that we all sin and that we're all going to die, but, 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 
The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that he told her how Jesus died for her to give her everlasting life. And he turned the pages of that book and he shared the gospel with her. And then he came to Romans 10 verses 9 through 13 and said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we asked her if she understood that she had sin in her life and that with sin, it would, sin would take her to hell. But she could ask Jesus into her heart and he would save her and forgive her sins. We asked her if she wanted to do that and she said she wanted to pray and we told her, you just talk to Jesus and so Tammy prayed. She didn't sign it, she just said, dear Jesus, come into my heart and save me. And she got saved. Ten years old. Five months later, on October 31st of 1979, Tammy was playing with a friend in the yard. There was a big tree in their front yard. She came out from behind that tree into the street and a guy, 18, maybe 20 years old, was unable to stop his car in time. He hit Tammy. She had a serious head injury and they took her to the hospital. And 24 hours later, Tammy died. But she went to heaven. Fred didn't say, oh, I'm too busy. I'm too tired. I don't have any time for visiting. I'll do it some other day. Maybe somebody else will tell her about Jesus. He said, we're going to go and see her today. And so we went. And she got saved, and she's in heaven tonight. That's what Jesus did. Jesus needed to meet this woman because he had something to tell her. Look at verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Here we see the Samaritan, first we see the Samaritan woman, secondly we see the Savior's words. The Savior, Jesus Christ had words of eternal life and he must needs go to give them to this woman. Now look with me at verse 10 again. He didn't say to this lady, look at your life, what a mess. First you need to change some things, and then you need to go to church, and then you need to be baptized, and you have to do some good works, and then I'll give you eternal life. He didn't. Jesus told this woman, if you knew who I was, if you knew that I was the Son of God, then you would ask of me. You would just ask me, it's that simple, and I would give you eternal life. Salvation is a free gift, and it's the same today. If you're here tonight, and somebody were, I were to ask you if you're saved, and your answer would be yes, because I'm baptized, that's not what the Bible says will get you to heaven. If your answer is yes, because I go to church, that's not what the Bible says will get you to heaven. If you say yes, because I give money to the church, that won't get you to heaven. If it's because you think your good works will somehow outweigh your bad works, and that will get you to heaven, that's not going to get you there according to God. When you turn to Jesus Christ and you trust in him alone to save you and you ask him, he will save you. I grew up in a good Lutheran church. I did a lot of good things growing up, but I was lost. When I was 13 years old, I went to a church where somebody shared the gospel with me. And I understood, and I prayed, and asked Jesus to save me, and I got saved that day, 40 years ago this February. I was saved. Well, maybe you're saying, I'm saved. I'm already saved. I already did that. I, there was a time, maybe it was three years ago, or five years ago, or 30 years ago. Praise God. What are you doing with the message that you have? What are you doing? Are you telling anybody? It's sad to say that a lot of us are like this. Imagine it's Sunday night after church. Your pastor's not here tonight. I'm, he's, he's out of town. 
but picture with me is Sunday night after church, and you come up and, oh, Pastor Agar, is your Pastor Agar? What a what a good message that was tonight. I'll see you Wednesday night, brother. That was great. You jump in your car and you go home and you sit down and it's go, go, go. Come on. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Score. Score, Miami Dolphins. Yeah. Yeah, let's go. Beat the Seattle Seahawks. Yeah. Let's go. Yes. Oh. I just know Miami's going all the way to the Super Bowl this year. Yes, we're going to get it. Seattle's going down. And you go to bed, and you get up Monday, and you go to work. You get home, and you eat supper, and then it's time. Oh, come on. But what's the matter with you, Kate? Can you do anything right? Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You stink. Oh, man. I hate those 49ers. San Francisco. Get them out of there. All you guys ever do is lose. Such a lousy game. Why don't you people just move out of Florida? We don't need you. Move to Georgia. <laughs> go to bed. You get up Tuesday. You go to work. Have your supper, and then it's time. NCIS. Oh, I like that. What a good show. NCIS LA. Like that one too. And then there's NCIS New Orleans. Like that. Then you go to bed. You get up. It's Wednesday morning. You got to go to work. You get home, you eat supper. Ooh, it's Wednesday night Bible study, church tonight. Oh, my back. Oh, my back. I don't think I can go to church. The pastor will understand. My back is hurting. I better stay home. HGTV. Property Brothers. Oh, man. How do these people afford all that? Where do they get all that money? Five hundred thousand dollars, six hundred dollars, six hundred thousand. Maybe they work four or five jobs. These people are crazy. Boy, I wish I could afford a house like that, though. Man, you go to bed that night, and it's Friday. It's Friday. It's Friday. No, yesterday was HGTV. Last night was Wednesday, NCIS was Tuesday. Oh, no, no, it's only, it's Thursday. You go to work Thursday, get home and have supper. Thursday night visitation program. Yeah, my back's still not doing so good. I think I better stay home tonight. Put on the TV. Nah, nah, not that, not that, not that. You run through all those channels and there's nothing good on TV. Oh, how about Netflix? You go through all of that. And then what about Amazon Video? And there's nothing good on TV. You get in the car and you ride down to Redbox and you start selecting some videos, get about three videos and go home. Back is feeling better now. Put on the TV and first video and it's a good movie. And then you put in the second one and start falling asleep. And you miss most of that movie. Too tired to watch it. But you put in the third movie. Somebody wakes you up, it's the wife. Hey, come on, it's late, you ought to go to bed. No, no, I'm not, I'm watching a movie. No, you're not, come on, it's late, you're sleeping, come to bed. Just go on, good night, go, I'll come when I'm ready, I'll come when I'm done, get out of here. And the movie ends. It's two o'clock in the morning, you're so tired. You drag off to bed. 
Get up, it's Friday, it's Friday, it's Friday. You go to work and you get home and you eat lunch and then you uh, go back to work and then it's 2.30 and then you go work and then it's 2.47 and then you work and it's 2.48 and this day will not go by and four o'clock finally comes and you go home and let's do something with the family. I don't know, where are we gonna go? Let's go down to the mall and look around. Maybe we'll get some ice cream on the way home. Dairy Queen. Oh, we don't want Dairy Queen. Let's go to Cold Stone Creamery. I don't know what you have here in your town, but everybody gets some ice cream and you go home and you go to bed that night. You get up the next morning, it's Saturday. You gotta put them on. <coughs> The wife is in the house vacuuming. Sometimes it's the other way around. The man's in there vacuuming and the wife's out there cutting the grass. <laughs> you wear yourself out working all day and you go to bed and you get up the next one. Oh, oh, well, it's Sunday. It is Sunday. Let's get everybody up. Let's get going. Come on. Hey, has anybody seen my Bible? Where's my Bible? Come on, hurry. Let's, we don't want to be late for church. Where's my Bible? Anybody see? Ah, there it is. There it is. Come on. Dust it off a little bit. And come on, let's go to church. Let's go. And everybody gets dressed and you drive over to the church and you get all fixed up nice and you go back and tell your pastor, oh, I'm so glad to be in church this morning. I love the word. God's been good. It might be funny, but sadly, we forsake the words of strength that we have to help us so that we can grow in our Christian lives. And we have words of hope for people that are lost, and we forget to take it out to them. Jesus met this woman. He gave her words of eternal life, and then this woman did something remarkable. Look at verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I did. This woman met Jesus for the first time in her life and started finding out who he was and realized that he was the Son of God. If you read the whole chapter, it's such a wonderful story. And she accepts him and then she says, just, just stay here for a minute. Don't, just stay here for a little while. I'll be right back. Just stay here. Don't go anywhere. And he says, I'll stay. And I'll, I'll be right here. She says, don't leave. Don't leave. Just make sure you stay right there. And she's so excited. She goes into town. And she says, hey, 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 listen, listen. He told me all that ever I did. And many of the people that city came out to meet him and heard who he was. And many of them were saved. Now look at verse 39 with me one more time. I don't see where this woman went to Bible college. I don't see where she took a 10 week lesson on soul winning. This woman met Jesus for the first time in her life and immediately then it says then she went out and told everybody. Maybe tonight you say, I know I should tell my friend, but I just really don't know what to say, and I'm not all that smart, and I, I might get it all garbled up and say it all wrong. And, you know, the pastor knows all that stuff, and he can say it so well, but I might not get it all right. I don't know. I don't think I can say anything. If you've been saved, you have a testimony. Go out and tell people what happened. My daughter, Amanda, went with me to it. We were on our way to a doctor visit and the elevator opened and she and I got on. She pushed the button and another lady came in behind us. So De Amanda asked her what floor she wanted and the lady said three. And so Amanda pushed three for her and then Amanda signed her, do you have Jesus in your heart? And the woman didn't know what she said. She said, what'd she say? What'd she say? And I saw that she asked me, I said, she wants to know if you have Jesus in your heart. Do you have Jesus in your heart? And the woman said, uh, and she got out as soon as the doors opened and left. 
But God can use my daughter. She's deaf. She's adopted from Peru. God can use me. God can use you. We can tell people about Jesus Christ. They need to hear. I was telling you about my friend Tammy. I went to her funeral. I was 14 years old. I couldn't believe a 10-year-old had died. It, was, it still shocks me today when I think about it. Her mom came over as I was standing there by the casket. And I told her how sorry I was, and she said, it's, it's all right. And she hugged me, and I, I embraced her. And she said, you remember when you gave Tammy a Bible? And we had given her a small blue King James gift Bible after she got saved. Her mom said, look down in there. And I looked, and they had placed that Bible under her hands. Her mom said she loved that book. Boy, that gave me chills. I didn't know. A few weeks later, we were out visiting. We went to the home of another family. I was with my teacher, Fred, and we introduced ourselves as from Palm Springs Drive Baptist Church and asked if we could visit, and they invited us right in. So we went in and sat down, and they had a deaf daughter, and the mother said after a while, did you know Tammy, the little girl that died a few weeks ago? And I said, yes, she was my neighbor and my friend. And she said, Tammy always brought her Bible to school every day. I didn't know that either. And I was excited to hear it. She said, my daughter had a birthday right before Tammy died. And she came to our house. She had a present under one arm and her Bible under the other. And she came into our house. And during the course of the party, she said, can I say something? And she ran over and she picked up her Bible and she brought it over. She didn't know any sign language. She opened it to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I couldn't believe she did it. What I didn't tell you is that her family was Catholic and she was not allowed to come to our church. She, we had invited her and invited her, but her mom said no. She'd never been in a church where a Sunday school teacher encouraged her to go out visiting and tell people about Jesus. She'd never been in a church where the pastor preached and said, we should take the gospel to the people. But Tammy still went out. She did it all on her own. How much more blessed are you and I to be here in a church where you have Pastor Agar that God has brought here to teach you the word of God, to tell you the responsibility that you have to go? But sadly, there's so many people in our country that just don't do anything about it. While people out there in Moses Lake In this area, in the state of Washington, are lost without the gospel. Who's going to tell them? I say, well, well, maybe later. Maybe later I will. Let's look at one more verse. Verse 39. Say not ye there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look unto the fields, for they are way already to harvest. It's time to wake up. It's time to look around us. There's a harvest that is ready right now. What are we waiting for? Well, I'm just waiting for the right time. I'm waiting for the right opportunity. I'm waiting till later. I'm waiting till I'm not busy. People are going to die and go to hell. God has given us a responsibility to go and tell them. Our family are supposed to our family's going to go and tell deaf people around the world, but you need to reach the people. You need to be God's missionary right here. You need to be like Jesus Christ. He came from Judah and went to Samaria to meet this woman and give her words of eternal life, and then she went out and reached many souls for the Lord. John chapter 4, verse 4, and he must needs go through Samaria. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you in prayer, and we're so thankful for the message tonight. Lord, we have a responsibility, 
of sharing the gospel. Lord, not only here in Moses Lake, but across the whole world. Lord, if we go and reach the uttermost, but we don't reach here, it's a waste. Lord, I pray that you will help the people here to take the gospel here in Moses Lake. Lord, maybe there's someone here tonight that isn't saved. They've never asked Jesus Christ into their heart, received him as their Savior. Lord, I pray that you'd help them understand that they must know you to be able to go to heaven. And thank you for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.